I hope I have something interesting to say. We'll see what you're asking me today. We'll see. Yeah, I have the same thing happens every time you and I talk, which is um, a few days before the conversation, I think, well, I'm pretty well versed in this topic. I've watched all of these documentaries. I've read all the stuff online. I've read articles. I follow you on Twitter. And, you know, just a few hours before the conversation, I'll go to your website, read some things up, and I'll be ready. And then I go to your website, start reading it, and it turns out that the rabbit hole goes way deeper than I previously thought. And I end up feeling overwhelmed and like I'm still scratching the surface of this thing. But I think it's worth scratching the surface. And I do have a kind of an angle for this conversation. So let me pitch it to you and you tell me whether it makes sense to you and whether you think it's important. So the reason, I mean, there are multiple reasons why the story of Scientology is seems to me uh, both interesting and like important, relevant to other spheres of life outside of that particular story. But one dimension in particular that just uh, continues to fascinate me is the way um, or even the ways that it allows on the one hand uh, for, uh, for the participants of, of the church to change their own reality to shape it to rewrite their biography their past their the way they relate to the world so there is kind of sort of a liberating kind of uh dynamic there you feel empowered to change the narrative of your own life and on the other hand as you're doing that there are these structures at play and uh um you know the the trajectory of a Scientologist's uh, sort of career also enslaves them at the same time. So you are rewriting your own reality, but also Hubbard is, or, you know, Hubbard is gone now, but uh, the, the this beast is still here, is also rewriting your reality and provides a kind of meta-narrative for everybody's uh, individual realities. And it's almost that, let me give you like my simplified, crude version, you know, one lens uh, through which you can look at the story of Scientology that uh, is kind of compelling to me. And you tell me whether it makes sense and uh, whether it's useful to look at the story through, through that lens. It's something like this. There was this guy, L. Ron Hubbard. Uh, you know, at the beginning of the story, he is a writer, fiction writer, very prolific, apparently not very good. I haven't actually read his fiction, but from the reviews that I've seen, not very compelling. Um, also, apart from like uh, having, uh, you know, being into writing stories, he also liked to make stories up about his own life, tell, uh, you know, these tall, tall tales about he was, how he was a World War II hero and things like that, had interests in various sort of psychological or even magical practices. So you have that guy a young, prolific writer who can't really write a story that would grip you so much that for the time of you, you know, turning the pages, it becomes your reality, but he writes a lot. And then fast forward a couple of decades, he has created this whole social structure, philosophy, model of the psyche, set of practices, uh, organization that, as I said, on the one hand, allows you to change your reality, to start shaping your real reality actively. On the other hand, in, in the most kind of uh, in-your-face example of, of this dynamic where Scientology starts changing your reality, at OT3, which we talked about in one of our conversations before, it turns out that this whole cosmic biography of yours that you created, you've started remembering your, at the time when you were in the womb and then before that, you are shaping that, but then it turns out that that is just one of the stories in this big meta narrative with the cosmic drama unfolding in, in the universe. And that story is basically one of those shitty stories that Hubbard started off with writing for, for magazines. And so it's, to me, it's almost like a story of a writer who found a very strange roundabout way to make his story not just compelling, but more compelling than any fiction you read, 
if you get to that place because it becomes the foundational kind of narrative of your reality and of realities of everybody you know because by that time you probably only know science objects so you're not in, in that all makes sense to you that seems like a reasonable way to look at it well yeah i think i think uh you hit on some very essential truths about the whole situation i remember uh one of the first things that comes to my mind when you mentioned that was some conversations i had with tori chrisman almost 20 years ago uh this whole idea that scientology's appeal in part is that people kind of project onto it this idea that this is going to take me to this freedom that i want this is going to help me create the life that i want and it's very it is escapist i, I mean I, you know a lot of people i think are drawn to it because you know scientology itself calls it finding your ruin you've got some problems in your life you're not your mm -hmm. career isn't going as well as you, you'd like your relationships aren't good your life is just turning out not to be what you were hoping it would be. And Scientology extends this you know, idea that you can reach your full potential and everything you ever wanted, all your fulfillment through Scientology. And what the, 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 the paradox there is that at, while people are looking for that escapism, they're, they're intrigued by this idea that they actually have lived trillions of years and on other planets and they're discovering these incredible lives that they've had during that whole process and when you're trying to fulfill this incredible new narrative about yourself, you're actually being indoctrinated into this heavy, heavy set of rules and regulations and restrictions. Uh, and I think one of the people that expressed it the best for me, like I said, was Tori Crispin almost 20 years ago when I was talking to her about it. And she was, Tori's, uh, I wrote about her in 2001. I think she, her story's really interesting because she was, really one of the first people to come out like live on the internet. She came, she left Scientology while it was happening. It's a very famous incident. And uh, my story about her is still online. She, it's fascinating. Tori, back then she was known as Tori Bazazian. But she was telling me how, you know, she was essentially a hippie, you know, like a lot of young people that were getting into Scientology in the 60s and 70s. And she was drawn to it by this idea that it was all about free expression and freedom and free speech. Uh -huh. And that's what she was really after. She wanted to get away from a, her father was actually a, a, a professional football player. So that must have uh, brought some, uh, you know, some, some privilege to it. But she still found herself very confined and limited by her, you know, suburban upbringing or whatever. And so like a lot of young people at that time, they were looking for something more, looking for something more important in their lives. And she said when the irony struck her or when the, when the sort of discordant, uh, paradox hit her was she she had got into it in san francisco and then she went down to los angeles i think and she walked in and again she's looking for this this freedom of expression this way, this way of creating this really great free life and they've got this picture of hubbard on the wall that's like six feet high like they're worshiping mao and she and she's like realized like this doesn't make sense how could we how could we be trying to enrich our lives through freedom when they've got these giant portraits of this guy, which they who they clearly bow down to, and that was I, I think she was one of the first ones that helped me understand that there is that paradox going on that people inside of it don't even see it. I mean, they buy all the slogans that um, you're we, we make the able more able, for example, is one of their slogans. Uh, another one is that we teach people to think for themselves. And the reality is that whole time that they're absorbing these ideas, their lives are becoming more and more controlled. And um, they, they, it's, it's one of the most oppressive uh, cultures that I've ever run across. I mean, you are liable to be uh, turned into, you're, you're liable to be turned into the organization for violating its rules by your own children. Right. or by your own parents. I mean, this is like East Germany on steroids, okay? You can't even like think, you know, negative thoughts in your own house without risk of your spouse writing you up in what's called a knowledge report and turning you in. So, yeah, it's an incredible paradox that they believe that they're achieving some incredible freedom in their lives when everything about Scientology from the very beginning is all about clamping down control of your life so the organization has total control 
over what you do, where your money goes, who you associate with. And ultimately, if you want to follow those rules, you, you risk everything, your family, your business, your livelihood. So uh, that's one of the great, great paradoxes. Another thing you mentioned in that that I, I wanted to uh, talk about a little bit was um, Hubbard's uh, background as a writer, which is also an interesting thing that you brought up. Um, there's actually a new book coming out this month uh, by a man named Alec Navala Lee. Uh, he's a really great guy. Uh, I was very fortunate that he came and joined us at our HowdyCon convention this summer in Chicago. We all got to meet him. He's got a really interesting book coming out about um, uh, John W. Campbell, who ran Astounding Magazine, and his top three writers, who were Isaac Asimov, um, uh, uh, oh, whom I'm blanking on, uh, Robert Heinlein, of course, and then Hubbard. And and he's, he really focuses on the 40s. So the period when Campbell really fell for Hubbard's ideas, and it's it's unsparing. He's dug up some original stuff I haven't seen elsewhere about those early years. The, the group effort that Dianetics was, which I think a lot of people forget that it wasn't just Hubbard who put that book together. And um, uh, that, you know, Hubbard, as far as his fiction goes, you, you were wondering about the quality of it. I have read it. Um, Hubbard's fiction is interesting because it was, it usually was a matter of what, how much effort he, he, he expended. One of, I guess one of Hubbard's flaws was that he was able to write pretty easily mm -hmm. and quickly. And so the vast majority of, he, of what he wrote was pedestrian simply because he just didn't care. I mean, you could tell these stories were, they're repetitive, they're, they're, they're obvious, the, the characters are, are out of central casting. I mean, the guy just didn't put much effort into it. And then you, could, you run into a piece of writing where he really cared about it, thought about it, and you can really see the difference. So that's that's the main, I think, criticism of, of Hubbard he, is he just he just wasn't uh, you know very uh, didn't put much effort into his work, and so most of it is forgettable. But I I enjoy going through some of his early stories for for hints of what is coming in in Scientology, uh, and and Alec does some of that in his book. But I think the short story that's that's really a revelation, and if you haven't seen it, you should take a look at it. In 1940, okay, so a full decade before Dianetics, he wrote a book, he wrote a short story called One Was Stubborn. Mm -hmm. And it's incredible. He predicts this future where the United States of America is taken over by evil cults with evil cult leaders. And um, the, the, the power that this cult has is that they tra train people how to make matter disappear with their minds. I mean, it's, it's really astounding that he, you know, there's no question Hubbard had thought and thought deeply about a lot of these issues about, you know, cult thinking and manipulation of matter with the mind. So, uh, and then another th thing that I, I, I try to point out to people is it's, you know, there's this famous statement he made in 1948 or 1949, just before Dianetics came out, a few different people heard him say it, that, you know, the making a, you know, it, it's no way to make a living as a, as a Pulp Fiction writer. You're only making a penny a word if you really want to make a million dollars to start your own religion. Um, I don't think there's any question that he did say something like that. But there's something even better, and that is a, a letter he wrote to Forrest Ackerman in January 1949. So Dianetics was mostly done by that point. He's getting it ready for publication. And he told, and Ackerman is this famous figure in science fiction. He was kind of like the, the super fan of, of the time and, he, and a literary agent in his own right, he was Hubbard's literary agent and um, very close friend with Hubbard and Hubbard uh, was very uh, open with him in his letters. And in this letter in 1949, he said that, you know, with this book, you can rape women without them knowing it. You can hypnotize people to sell them things. And he said, and I don't know, I don't know if I'm gonna destroy the Catholic church or just start my own. He, he said that in 1949. That's very interesting way of putting it. Yeah. So, you know, there's, it, I don't think there's any question that he had these things in mind. I don't know that he had it all planned out because the first couple of years after Dianetics came out, he did sell it as a science. And uh, people like John Campbell were taken in. They thought this really was a science to affect the human mind. It wasn't until 53, after he'd been through bankruptcy and, and things were really struggling, that Hubbard told a, a follower of hers that, you know, we should try the religion angle. 
So that's uh, so I, I think he had it in mind originally, but he didn't really become determined to do it until 53. Mm -hmm. So what I want to do or try to do is to, uh, you know, I was going through, you have on the side, you have this series uh, of the bridge where uh, an ex Scientologist kind of guides the readers and you as the interviewer uh, right. through the trajectory of, of a Scientologist, uh, what do you want to call it, spiritual career. Yeah. Um, and I want to uh, pause on some things there and just to see how, what tools are at use there to, as I say, on the one hand, allow the participant to shape their reality and at the same time, how slowly they become uh, completely uh, engrossed into this, you know, totalitarian right. kind of structure and, and, and the vision of the world. But maybe before we go there, even um, so, you said Dianetics at first was a, a group effort, and I think in one of our early conversations, you mentioned a little bit about Hubbard's own kind of earlier excursions into. He was a hypnotist. He was into Aleister Crowley. He was uh, doing these tapes where he would like kind of self-program himself for success or whatever. Um, so. Is there like a starting point? What is the earliest uh, thing he does for himself to try to actively change his own reality and, and reshape his own uh, life? Well, I mean, he was a very ambitious young man. I mean, right from the very beginning, he, he, he I mean, even, even as a teenager, uh, he was very good at telling tall tales and manipulating people. In 1927, when he was 16, he had gone to the Far East because his father had been, as it was a Navy lieutenant, he was stationed in Guam. And he had gone out there with his mother uh, and he came back and he just spun these tall tales for the newspaper in Montana where he was a high school student and they bought it. Mm -hmm. And I think he realized that he had that gift that he could convince people of things that, uh, and there was a basis of truth to what he was saying. He, he genuinely had been to these places in Japan and China and the, the Philippines and Guam, but he always exaggerated things for effect and to make himself look like a more of an expert. He would tell these tall tales about poisonous snakes and, and buried gold, and he loved the way people just ate it up. And I think so from a very early age, he understood that he had a talent for making a, a future for himself based on his ability to persuade people of things that he was embellishing. Uh, that pattern was set very early. Mm -hmm. um, and he, you know, he, he kept falling upwards. I mean, he had a Navy Lieutenant for a father who, after he flunked out of high school, got him into a crammer, which uh, it's a, a, basically a prep school to get him into college. He got into college, he flunked out of that, but he still, you know, made connections and stuff. So he was always, you know, he was a, he failed high school, he failed college, but he always found a way, like I said, to kind of fail upwards. And he had a lot of talent for storytelling. And then in the 30s, uh, after college, he started writing for, for the magazines. And he, he, he like I said, his, his talent was speed. Uh, I mean, this was the Depression, and people were struggling to make a living. And, and at that time, uh, even though these pulp magazines only cost, you know, a nickel uh, at the at the newsstand, they actually paid pretty well to writers, and you could make a living selling short stories as long as you wrote enough of them. And again, right. that was his talent. So he was sending out stories every day to Western magazines, romance magazines, detective magazines. Uh, science fiction was only one of his interests, and in fact. I think his son mentioned that it was not his favorite. Science fiction kind of didn't interest him. He, he actually said he didn't like the gadgets. He, he, liked, he liked concepts of science fiction and time mm -hmm. travel and stuff like that, but he really didn't. He, he never has a lot of spaceships that he, de he describes and things like that. It's all kind of hand wave. Um, and uh, so, you know, but he wrote for everybody. Um, Nibs, his son, said there were times when he could pick up a magazine on the newsstand. And he would use, Ron would use multiple uh, pseudonyms, right, pen names. And Nibs said that his dad could pick up a magazine and point to every article in that issue, and he had written them all. That's how fast, that was his number one talent, was that he wrote so many short stories, he was able to make a living in the, in the depths of the Great Depression. 
So you got to give them credit for that. But the quality, you know, nobody today is really, except the Church of Scientology, is really honoring and, and you know, uh, talking about the quality of L. Ron Hubbard's fiction writing. What about these, uh, I don't know what you call them, psycho practices, oh. psychological? Yeah, yeah. So, and then along that, so you asked for kind of a landmark, kind of a milestone. So he, you know, like I said, he was always sort of working on his own legend, always. He, uh -huh. You know, he... He, he, yes, his mother took him to Asia to see his dad. They came back uh, and they saw some interesting sights and he kept a diary. We know what they actually saw. But then when he told people about it, he was on this magical spiritual tour and he was hanging out with shamans and stuff. I mean, it's just all nonsense, but it's the way he liked to pump up his, his myth. And so he was doing that from a, from a young age. And then a key moment is in the 30s, um, he had married his first wife uh, by... 32 or 33, I'm forgetting now. And they had uh, Nibs and, and Katie, their uh, son and a daughter. And um, they, uh, in, then he got going on the, the fiction writing. He was doing well. He was going to New York. The, the wife and kids were back in Washington State. And then she said that um, at some point in about 38 or something before the war, he wrote this letter to her, tell, admitting to her that his goal was as he put it to smash his name into history and that same period 38 is when he had a, a kind of a mystical experience he had a tooth problem and went to the dentist and they put him out for the procedure and while he was under sedation he had this vision where he basically went to heaven or somewhere and saw all of the world's knowledge uh laid out in front of him and then he came back and realized that he now had this, this incredible vision that uh, because he was able to come back, he, he now was going to be the conduit of the world's wisdom or whatever. So this was a very, very big moment for him. He write, and, and again, he writes the letter at that time. He now knows what his life work is. He's going to smash his name into history. And this is when he actually begins writing the work that 12 years later will eventually become Dianetics. At that time, he called it Excalibur, and he had his, his great insight. And Scientologists to this day will tell you that this is actually a great insight. But his great insight was that the meaning of life was to survive, right. which, you know, wow, what an insight, right? So, uh, but to him, this was like earth-shaking knowledge. And uh, so that, that was kind of what, uh, was informed in that first manuscript Excalibur, which he never, he, he had this great gimmick. He would tell people that he'd written this incredible book of human knowledge, but he couldn't show it to anybody because the first dozen people he showed it to, half of them killed themselves, yeah. right? So that's how he built up excitement, just the same way, you know, Mark Twain and, and Huckle Finn talks about, you know, the trouble begins at 8 p.m. You know, I mean, there's a way, he was a very good salesman of his own story. And so he convinced people that that this manuscript was too dangerous to show anybody. Uh, I have seen descriptions of it, and it's 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 clear that it's basically just a portion of what eventually became Dianetics, which of course anybody could read, and nobody commits suicide. You might I, I, I can imagine people going to sleep reading Dianetics, but uh, I don't imagine people jumping off a cliff. So that's so by thirty eight, I think he's got this image that he's going to somehow shake up the world through ideas. Then the war comes and he, uh, you know, for him, the war was this amazing opportunity. Guys like Hubbard really were looking forward to, you know, having this opportunity to have this heroic experience. And then it was a disaster. World War II was just basically a disaster for him. He got up, he, he got into the Navy, he became a Lieutenant. He was um, very quickly, he, he was given command of a ship that was being refitted in Boston Harbor. He lost that command after one day. It was such a disaster and, the, and the, his crew hated him so much, they took him off of that. He then went out west and became the commander of a, a boat that uh, was a sub chaser that had uh, death charges. And famously, uh, after he took command of that ship just off the coast of Oregon, uh, he engaged in this 35 hour battle with what he claimed were two Japanese submarines, but the Navy itself concluded that he was shooting at a log and uh, a magnetic deposit on the seafloor. 
And from there, he sailed south down uh, the coast, the West Coast, until they got near Mexico, and he opened fire on a Mexican island for target practice, which caused an international incident, and then he was removed from that command. And so by the time the war ended, he was in a hospital in, in, um, on the West Coast, and he was hospitalized for um, uh, hemorrhoids and pink eye. Uh, and we have we have the records. There's no question about this. But he told people that he'd been machine gunned <laughs> in Java, and that he had survived uh, being in an open raft in the ocean for a month. I mean, just he invented all these incredible stories about how heroic World War II was for him. But uh, so that after the war, then he got back to this idea that he was going. Then he got involved with Parsons and Crowley and and, and uh, uh, Crowley. I'm sorry. Crowley is how you say it correctly. Crowley was in England. He never met Crowley, but they were they were doing they were following Crowley's teachings and he got into this sex magic stuff. And then finally in 1950, he came out with this book that really he sort of been thinking about for a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there is at least a basis. Like it's not all um, just making things up. It's part of the, the there is some core in Dianetics that he used for himself. He was doing these different practices, and I guess. Throughout then the Scientology career, he was also like doing auditing on himself and stuff, right? So it's not, there's a part of it that is important and relevant to himself and he's using that for his own. Uh, well, he claimed, he claimed that he had been machine gunned and he was <laughs> blind and he, that's why he was in the hospital at the end of the war. And then he hit upon these techniques which had cured him. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, even Tommy Davis as recently as 2011, uh, 2010 had told Lawrence Wright that, um, you know, this is the story that that he healed himself of his war wounds with this thing that became Dianetics, which is the basis for everything the Church of Scientology is about. And if that story isn't true, then Scientology isn't true. Well, you know, then Lawrence Wright got the actual military records and showed there was no truth to the story at all. So, you know, this was a guy who was a skilled stage hypnotist who saw himself as the master of other people, master of men, who actually said to himself in those 1940s affirmations, they're called, that he was gonna enslave other people. And he came up with this parter trick where you concentrate to the point of uh, trance and convince yourself that you are removing these memories. And, uh, and initially it was just that you were somehow remembering what had happened to you in the womb, but then a few years later when they developed Scientology, you're going back thousands, millions, billions of years to remember, quote, remember what happened to you on other planets and other, you know, eras. So, um, you know, this was a stage hypnotist to convince people that they were going through these activities, and he backed it up with these uh, incredibly repetitive, time-intensive, exhausting, um, uh, activities that people go through called training routines and you know outside experts will look at TR0 uh, which are basically staring exercises and some of these other exercises where you're putting people through motion repetitive motions um, and other and then just regular auditing where you're questioning people for hours and days Outside experts take one look at that and say, well, they're just putting you in a trance. So you're suge suggestible, and so you'll say anything. You'll dream up anything. You know, it's, even, and it's funny because even ex-Scientologists who have left and are very critical of David Miscavige, the current leader and everything, it, you know, not all of them will – it takes a while before they'll say to you, yeah, those, mem those quote, memories I had from 10 million years ago on another planet, I guess I dreamed those up. I mean, some of them are aware of it at the time. That's what's really amazing, man, is that – they will tell you that, yeah, I kind of knew at the time that I was just sort of dreaming it up. But it, by that time, you're, you know, they've got you on this conveyor belt. Well, another thing that's just really powerful about Scientology that Hubbard should get credit for is, you know, as, as the way some of us say today, he gamified it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so many people have pointed out how much Scientology is like a role playing game. And it is, you're always trying to get that next level. And, uh, and, um, uh, Paul Haggis pointed this out in Going Clear. He was saying, you know, initially you go through these exercises and they're really interesting because, you know, they do train you to have more concentration and to be able to deal with any kind of interruptions. 
Um, I mean, I think it's part of the, I think it's definitely part of the hypnotism, but, but, you know, people, people enjoy that. And then he said, but so the next couple of levels didn't work so well, but then by that time you want to, how can you stop? You're on, you know, you're on grade two, you know, there's a grade three. How can you stop now? So very, very clever the way he gamified it that way and made it so that you're always trying to, you're, you're, you're always around people that are several levels higher than you. And you you don't like feeling that feeling of inferiority. You want to be on their level with them. And also you assume they have some kind of insight or perhaps superpower that they're hiding from you and you need to get to their level to get that. And that's that people chase that for decades. Yeah. I mean, they don't spend and, and millions of dollars so they can finally say, I've been to OT8, I've been to the top. But the other smart thing that Hubbard put into it is you can't say anything about it. You're not supposed to talk about anything that happened in your sessions with anybody else. The reason why that's so smart is that virtually everyone who goes through this and goes through this past life therapy ends up deciding that they were Jesus Christ or they were Julius Caesar or they were Joan of Arc. And the problem is if they were allowed to discuss it with each other, they'd realize that it's all nonsense. But they're, they think they think they're having this incredible experience. Oh my, I'm Jesus Christ and nobody knows it. You know, wow, what a feeling. So um, again, that's part of the control. Uh, it's part of the it's part of the manipulation, and um, it's 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 just shot through the whole organization. Yeah, a few things came to mind while you were talking. One is, I do want to. Um, how should I put it? Uh, I don't want to like make too much fun of people who say you know. Uh, it's like looking from the outside in. It's easy to say, how could you believe in this? How could you uh, think that you those past lives that you dreamed up were real? And that element is like, this is, I, I think, one of the major strengths of Scientology as the system is it's all based on experience. You go through these uh, trainings and these practices, and uh, there's a whole vocabulary that I've written somewhere here. There's a, a dozen of different terms for what, it is that they do, but it's if it's your experience, um, if you know you were asked. Uh, I, I think you brought up in one of our old conversation. There's some uh, training where you're asked a question, some like where do you feel comfortable, where where do you feel safe, three hundred times in a row. Right. When like those, you give answers, and those are your answers. You were trying to be sincere, and you were trying to be attentive to what thoughts bubble up, and many of these thoughts would surprise you. You didn't expect to say something uh, like, like what, the, what would you end up saying? And then you're left with that. That was your di direct experience. You, something inside you did, you know, mention the past life of being on a different planet and being, uh, you know, decapitated or something. And that's difficult to dismiss when, when it's not something that you read, it's not something that somebody else told you, but it came from you. That is, you know, that can be powerful. Well, and, 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 and what also makes it powerful is this e-meter. You know, they're convinced right. that, you know, this thing I just, re quote, remembered from 10 million years ago sounds kind of crazy. I mean, I was the um, overlord of a prison planet, and I was uh, committing genocide and killing people by the millions. That's, that's kind of disturbing and crazy. But look, the machine says that's true. And that's part of what cements it for them is, well, the machine says it's true. They have no idea that this machine is complete crock, you know, that, you know, it, it, it's, it's compromised by the fact that you hold these cans. Nobody holds anything perfectly still. There's always going to be an element of that signal being corrupted by the fact that you change your grip. Um, the e-meter is garbage, but they are convinced that it's infallible. And so this crazy memory they've had, suddenly it's like, well, it's the machine says it's real, so it's real. It's not until they come out much later that they realize, yeah, I guess that wasn't real. Um, I agree with you. I, I, I agree and, and disagree. I, I, I always try to be sympathetic to people telling me their stories about Scientology mm -hmm. that, that um, uh, you know, obviously some of them grow up in it. They don't really know anything else. Other people, they're always brought in at a vulnerable moment, like they've lost a job or they've lost a relationship. Scientology is mm -hmm. very good at, at, at – uh, of manipulating them and they're also they, they're very smart in the way they sort of appeal to reason and convince you 
Hubbard was very, very smart in setting it up so that you convince yourself that it's real. You're not, you're not accepting things from Hubbard on faith. He's telling you, well, if we ask you these questions and this machine op operates in a certain way, then, then, then what that indicates is X, Y, and Z. And so then you go through it and realize, wow, that, that must be true. And so they're very manipulative and you don't realize it when you're going in. So I do try to be sympathetic. Uh, but I do have to say, though, is that ex-Scientologists also need to own a little bit of their gullibility. Uh, I, I, remember I, was, I remember I was watching Leah Remini's uh, show last season, and there was a fantastic episode she had with her mother where they, they, re they basically revealed what's in OT8, which has never been done on television before. It was a fantastic episode. But uh, her mom, Vicky, who's wonderful, Vicky said something great. They were asking her why she first got into Scientology, and I guess she had worked in the medical field or something. She was a nurse, or, or you know, or she had wanted to, or something in her life. And what impressed her was she had picked up this, you know, three dollar book of Dianetics, and it promised a future with no illness. And she was just that's so great. And so I, I got into it, and I thought to myself, wait a minute. So a three dollar paperback tells you it has the answers to a future with no illness. And you bought it? I mean, at some point, ex-Scientologists need to own up to the fact that that should not have convinced you of anything. That should not have drawn you into anything. I mean, you know, so I, I, I try to look at it from both sides. I totally mm -hmm. sympathetic to Scientologists that smart people are can be brought into this thing. But I also look at, at you just look at the way Scientology, and look at, read Dianetics. I can't. You know, if you read Dianetics and you're convinced of every anything, I mean, it's just garbage. It's just, it's so, it's, I, the, one of the first reviews, it might have been Scientific American, I'm not sure, 1950 said there are more claims and less evidence in this book than anything that's been put on paper, you know, and, and, and it's true. So, uh, you know, uh, they are very good at manipulating people, but people have to admit that often we are easy to manipulate. All of us are, me too. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's why Scientology works. But only on a small number of people. We've got to keep in mind, Scientology only ever appeals to a very small minority of people. Yeah. Okay, so I, I want to get into this, uh, the, the practices. Just one quick aside before that. You, you mentioned this mystical experience that uh, Hubbard had, and I either yeah. didn't know about it or forgot about it. Now that you, that you said it, are you by any chance a Philip K. Dick fan? This sounds very similar to what he had gone through with also, I think, a tooth surgery. He had a fugue state. Absolutely, no question. Philip K. Dick went through the same kind of thing. You're right. And uh, um, I don't know, you know, with Hubbard, he was under sedation. I mean, what, you know, okay, so we had a vision. I mean, it's not, I don't think that it's all that miraculous or anything. It's just, it's not so much that he had a vision under sedation is that he then decided that there was a reality to it and that he had basically been anointed this great uh, right. uh, you know conduit of knowledge to the world that's that's the part where you're like well no you just you know had kind of a strange trip under you know an anesthetic you know I would make the same point that I just said about you know Scientologists like the the power of, power of the direct experience as a person who's done quite a bit of psychedelics you know you said it's it's weird that Scientologists present this the goal of life is to survive as an epiphany it seems like a pretty obvious thing but I'll tell you what, if you feels, experience that you know that, that you know you have hallucinations and you have some sort of a world knowledge imparted on you that might have more weight to it than if you just thought about it while reading uh, you know the theory of evolution well, I tell you what, if Philip K. Dick had started a church, I might, I might want to belong to it. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, there's a real writer, and I think he had, uh, uh, you know, a much, uh, a more sort of, uh, I'm much more sympathetic to his point, of, uh, his ideas about humanity, than Hubbard's. But anyway, uh, it's good to see, uh, you know, his books being turned into movies now. It's great. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Okay. So let's try to go into these practices, the, what Scientologists call tech. And what I want to attempt is to like pause everyone and once in a while and, and appreciate 
what happens here? How what what forces are are starting to work on a person, as as we talked about, you know, this in this paradoxical manner of both giving you some power in authoring your own life, but also enslaving you at the same time. Right. So well, yeah, the, the that series. I'm really glad we got to maybe do that series. I think it was three or four years ago now, maybe longer. And um, I was very fortunate to uh, partner with. Claire Headley on that for the most part, but also brought in Bruce Hines near the end. And um, uh, Claire was fantastic. I mean, one of the things she, you know, we were looking at the lower level. So one of the first things you do are these training routines, very repetitive. They're staring exercises essentially. And then there are these word exercises you go through. What Claire was saying in these early uh, exercises, uh, like with study tech. So he, they convince you that you've been studying wrong. And the key to everything is looking up words in dictionaries. I thought that, that was brilliant. All of your problems are based on the fact that you skip passwords you don't understand. So you need to look things up in dictionaries and then you need to model them in clay. Um, the three concepts of study tech are the misunderstood word, going up a gradient, and uh, having mass. Uh, so so mis misunderstanding a word, you just you need to constantly use the dictionary and in a way that's just obsessive and, and, and really counterproductive. Can and you then, pause on that and give me an example? Do I imagine yeah. it correctly? You're like, right. look so, up a word, then you look up the words in the definition of that word, and then you look up. They use it as punishment. I mean, I mean they'll, they'll, they'll tell a child, you know, uh, okay, you misbehave, go look up all the definitions of the word to uh, the, you know. And so it becomes, you know, it's just, it's, it's really kind of sick the way they do it. Uh, there's nothing wrong with looking things up in the dictionary, but like all things in Scientology, they take it to such an extreme that it really slows down, you know, it, it, actual educators that have looked at this say that it's not really a very smart way to learn. Second of all is the idea of gradient, that you can't, you can't learn too quickly, you have to learn in steps, which again sounds reasonable, but they always take it to an extreme. And then finally that you learn best through mass, which is that you not only read about concepts, but you model them in clay so that you have an object. And again, they take this to ridiculous extremes. I mean, you should see some of the models that they make people do in clay. So you're doing all this. And again, none of it sounds too objectionable. But what Claire pointed out is through all of this in the staring exercises, the word exercises, the study tech, everything is intended to convince you that Scientology's ideas are the only ideas with validity. Mm -hmm. And you are replacing whatever, you know, values you had that you brought to Scientology, you were replacing them with ultimately with something, a policy called keeping Scientology working. And this becomes the single most important policy in your life. And she says, you know, as you're going through these basic exercises, it may not seem like you're radically turning over the way you think, but you are. And the whole point is about control and manipulation until ultimately you become completely dedicated to Scientology at the expense of everything else. So she says there is no, there is no innocent exercise in Scientology, even at the lowest levels. It's all intended to create that indoctrination and control. I thought this word thing was fascinating and brilliant in a sinister kind of way. Again, part of the, part of the reason learning about Scientology is so interesting to me is because, again, looking outside in, most people feel this like this is crazy. How do you even you know? How do you not notice that you're in this situation when you're in a cult? But at the same time in the structure you see so many dynamics that you can then find in political groups in other religious groups in uh, movements ideologies and and all of that and i think that's valuable when you see something that you very quickly dismiss as insane and then you notice the same thing in something that you might be a part of or somebody you know might be a part of that's valuable that gives you a little insight and the word thing was uh, uh, seemed like a good example of that to me, because so one thing is this constant looking things up. If you if something's not working or if if you have some trouble understanding the thing, 
you need to understand the concepts deeper and look words up and then look words within those definitions up. And then in parallel to that, there is just going through this up the bridge series, there's so much new vocabulary. There's so many yeah, terms. I was just gonna mention that, right. That that you learn and you assimilate, and then I assume you look them up a whole lot. And then, you know, it's this uh, this idea, the limits of my language are the limits of my world, right? So what you're doing here is you're adopting a new language and you there's this repetitive, almost trans-inducing study-like practice of making sure that language really is, you know, integrated into your the, the very way you think about things. And once you have that, you don't like before you even start making an argument, before you even start thinking about things, you already have the words and the categories with which you're going to build that argument. And those are already put you in the context of this like Scientology thinking. Yeah. But again, the same thing can be found in political ideologies. You know, if you if you read Marx and you for the first time see the world as oh, there are classes and there is a struggle between classes. And that's how we look at the historical process. If that becomes, it can be enriching if that's like an additional perspective that you have. It's a, another language you've learned. But if it becomes the sole language you, you use, and I mean, Scientology really goes into at length to make sure that their framework is the only framework that you use. Um, then you become enslaved in this thing before you even start using it uh, to, to build a, a narrative. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a part of the tribalism is that, you know, um, as you're going through Scientology, you're not only looking up words, but yeah, you're adopting their words. And Hubbard had, like like all leaders of these kind of groups, had invented a lot of words and terms that you are then obliged to learn and use. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's really fun when you're talking to ex-Scientologists and they've been out of the church for 20 years and they'll just come out with a sentence it's nothing but scientologies it's mm -hmm. really hard to to let go of that language once they learn it these are real basic concepts about you know uh, uh how to learn how to think how to respond to people uh what what ideas are worth pursuing which ones aren't i mean it it really is a trap it's a trap of thinking uh it's a way of shutting down anything that doesn't you know uh follow their uh, guidelines and uh, it's it and it's seductive too. I use I use Scientology terms all the time. I, I find them. I mean, for for my purposes, they're fun and funny. But uh, which terms do you use? Oh, I'm always using words like confront and 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 cognite and interpolate and then theta. Uh, you know, I'm always using their terms and feeding weedy. I'll call you know somebody. <laughs> So it's you know it it it's uh some of them are useful some of them are fun but not in the context that Scientology uses them, I mean Scientology is using them as a way to define the debate, shut down objections, and really convince people that they're seeing things only in a Scientology way, and it's it's so well enshrined in that policy keeping Scientology working KSW, that's that's the one that they have to memorize and repeat, and it's the idea that. You know, not only has Hubbard come up with these ideas and these processes, but you can only do it the way Hubbard designed it. See, that's another thing that's part of Scientology history that's it's very interesting to look into, is that from the very beginning, remember, Hubbard claimed it was a science. And the nature of science is that if a scientist makes a discovery, another scientist can investigate it on their own and replicate the, uh, the, the uh, results. Because, a, a, you know, a, a scientific discovery is not owned by the scientist. It's, it's a physical fact that other people can then also find for themselves. And so from the beginning, when Hubbard was saying that this was a science, people took him up on that and said, okay, he's come up with these ideas about the human mind. Now I'm gonna work on those ideas and advance them, which is what you do when somebody has a biological discovery or a physical, you know, physical sciences discovery is that somebody else can come along and say, okay, that's understood, now let's go even farther. That drove Hubbard crazy. Because it is, it's not a science. It's his own little parlor trick, and it drove him crazy that other people would then try to refine it, and, and you know. And so he said from the very beginning, the thing that drove him more crazy than anything else in the early days were these splinter groups, 
and, and, and people that were saying, okay, thanks Hubbard for these ideas. Now we're taking it in our own direction. Oh, that just drove him mad. And so he's a lot of the early uh, security uh, policies were put in place to crack down on these other groups. And the, the word he came up with them were squirrels. If you weren't following Hubbard technology to the letter, the way he invented it, you were a squirrel and you were squirreling the technology. And they use that today. It's like the worst thing you can call a, a Scientologist can call somebody else is to call them a squirrel. So they believe in this just rigid. It's a, it's a fundamentalist group is what it is. It's, it's among the most fundamentalist groups you will ever find. They literally can't change what Hubbard said 60 years ago. Now, yes, David Miscavige is making some changes and in, in ways that is driving it's driving some people away because they are so dedicated to the way Hubbard did things. Um, but you know, essentially, uh, Scientology today is still trying to deliver what they call standard tech, mm -hmm. standardly, at his you know special uh, orgs. So, uh, and it all comes back to language. It all comes back to exactly the way you describe things, how you ask the questions, how people answer. Um, they, again, they, they say they're freeing you, but they're really putting you to a straitjacket, and it's a straitjacket of language. Let's go through uh, the, these earlier. You mentioned a bunch of times now the staring context. So it's like the first few trainings that you get, correct me if I uh, misremember something. There is first you need to learn how to just be there comfortably. So just sit and be okay with that. Which yeah, they if you when you go into a Scientology facility, you'll often see these pairs of chairs um, mm -hmm. set down facing each other with only a few feet between them. This is a very standard feature in Scientology because the first exercise you do, TR0, is the two, the two people sit down facing each other and just be, you know, uh, just you know, that just be there, and uh, then it becomes a staring contest where you're staring at the other person and you can't flinch. And I mean, we're talking hours. They spend hours, and if you are staring at the other person and you flinch, then you have to start over again. Then it moves on to okay, it's not just enough just to sit there. It's not just enough to sit there and stare at somebody. Now the other person is actively going to be trying to make you flinch. They're going to yell at you. They're going to insult you. This is called bull baiting. And again, you're just trying to just sit still. You've already gone through, you know, countless hours of of get of, of the idea of just slowing down and sitting and not moving. Now you're getting all this, you know, yelled at you and screamed at you. And and so you're trying to take that ability and extend it to where people could do anything in front of you and you're not gonna move a muscle. Now some people would say this is a really good skill to have. You know, if you're working in a tough environment, the boss is yelling at you, it's really good just to be able to just sort of take it and not scream back at your boss, right? Um, and there's definitely some, you know, something to that, that this is not, this is, this is a good sort of skill to have. On the other hand, you're producing somebody who can do this stare and never make a move, move a muscle which is very characteristic of Scientologists right. and somebody would, some people would say that's a cult stare, but you know, you're making it so people are very manipulable, very suggestible. Uh, and, and that's what's going on in these early exercises. And they, they spend so much time at it and they have to come. The other thing that surprised me when I was going through these with Claire was that when you get to the upper higher levels, whatever it is, whether it's the grades or the OTs or anything, the first thing you have to do is go back to the beginning and do everything all over again. I mean, you have to keep doing the personality test. You have to keep doing the TRs. You have to keep doing all, all these different processes. Reread Dianetics again. I mean, over and over and over and over. And so you can see why people just become this, like, so completely programmed by Scientology thinking. It's the repetition. I don't know how they do it. It's so boring, I, you know. And but I guess that it it kind of puts you into sort of this trance state where you're very suggestible. This bull baiting thing seemed uh, to me like one of the examples of this kind of paradoxical dynamic going on. Because on the one hand, you're learning to not be affected by anything that's happening around, so it's a kind of a source of strength. You, you once you go through these 
you know, attempts to abuse you or, or to insult you, then you can take anything. You kind of become stronger. At the same time, you're learning to allow the other person to do whatever to you. And there is an example in this particular, uh, when Claire was telling her story, I mean, this is a whole other issue with children. Many, she was born into Scientology and she's going through these trainings as a 10 year old, 12 year old. And in that particular thing with bull baiting, she said that uh, it was really uncomfortable when a grown man started unbuttoning her shirt. And so at that moment, yeah, you're learning to take whatever and you're strong, or are you allowing the other person to do anything that because you're, you know, developing as a as a, well, it's a Scientologist in this case, but I mean, I, I've seen that, I haven't been myself to these things, but there are many different groups that uh, propose to teach you how to be more effective. And this kind of dynamic where they try to push your buttons and you're supposed to learn to not react to that, that's pretty common there. It is. I mean, think about the military. I mean, the, right. the, the military needs somebody who can be, cal be calm and collected and remember their training and know what to do in the middle of a battlefield with bullets flying around and explosions going off. So, of course, the military is also interested in this kind of conditioning to just put everything out of your mind, follow your program, do what you're supposed to do. I think a lot of organizations value this kind of training. And, you know, it's, it's something that I think a lot of them do in one form or another. And sci in Scientology, it's the first thing you do is you just learn to empty your mind and just take that abuse. And then it becomes very valuable later on when they get you into the Sea Org. Mm -hmm. and, and you're working, you know, 13, 14 hours a day for pennies an hour. Uh, you may not, you may go years without having a day off or seeing anybody from your family or seeing any friends. And it's three o'clock in the morning and they've suddenly decided you've got to dump the last six hours of work and do something from scratch and you're tired and you're hungry and your life is, you know, so grim and that TR kicks in and you just like, yes, sir. That's what they're counting on. That's where the training is invaluable to them is that they know no matter what you ask that Sea Org person, no matter how miserable you've made them, no matter how much crap you've thrown at them, they're just going to look at you and acknowledge and say, yes, sir. And that's what you want. So, and then they pride, and then they pride themselves on it. That's the other thing I always find fascinating is that when I talk to former Sea Org officers and they talk about how they're on their last nerve and they're totally worn out and something's going on. And then, and then that's when the others will sort of like, you know, what, what are you a dilettante? You know, can't you keep up? I mean, they, they enforce it among themselves. If you see somebody breaking down, who can't handle it is losing their discipline is is you know complaining or they're then the others heap all kinds of abuse on them like where's your training where where's your trs so yeah you know some people will tell you that well i only went through the beginning parts and i thought it was really good and i really liked the uh exercises and it helped me be better in communication you know i don't think they always understand that that was part of this conditioning that allows them to create these people who can work for them around the clock and deny themselves, deny their families. That's what Scientology relies on. And it begins from day one in learning to stare. What about, you just mentioned communication. What about this business of, I didn't totally understand this, saying things over and over again in a certain way, like you're flunked, quote unquote flunked, if you say something unnaturally, but you're just repeating phrases like from Alice in the Wonderland. Or something right. like that again it's part of that conditioning that you you have to carry out a command the way it's supposed to be carried out and you know there's there's no varying so please whether, I mean, is there is there if the very correct way of saying a phrase from alice in wonderland how do you find out the right way to say it they whether it's alice in wonderland i mean that's just training so that when you're carrying out hubbard's uh commands they want them carried out perfectly so, I mean, I remember I was talking to, I think it was, um, well, I think it was Serge Gill, and he was telling me about um, one exercise he went through. It just sounded mindless. It had to do with the E-meter. And that it was just that you had to set up an E-meter in a particular way, describe the different components, 
and turn it on and turn it off or whatever. And that's it. There was no actual processing, but mm. that just described the e-meter and took it out of its box. Or what, it was just really basic stuff. And he said it was incredibly difficult because they would have you do it and do it and do it. And, and if you did the slightest thing out of order, flunk, start over again. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I asked him, I said, what was the point of that? And he said, oh, so that you're really, you're really familiar with the machine. I'm thinking, come on, really familiar with the machine? It takes five minutes to be familiar with that machine. There's only like three different knobs on it. It's clearly that, again, it's part of this incredible control that they want sunk into your mind. And that's why it's so hard. You know, I think even a lot of Scientologists don't realize this. They'll, they'll tell me they've been out for a decade and they're still having a hard time, you know, getting that way of thinking out of their minds and trying to readapt to the society at large. And I explained to them, I said, you went through hundreds and hundreds of hours of processing. Go touch that wall. Pick up this bottle. How heavy is that book? Stare into my eyes. Don't flinch. I mean, they spend hundreds and hundreds of hours going through these manipulative exercises that just really like brand on your brain these ways of thinking and short circuiting your intellect. And so, you know, it does take years and years afterwards to for them to realize, you know, I can just I can just relax today. I don't have to get anything done. I don't I, you know, I can read a book for pleasure. Uh, it, 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 it really can put a whammy on people. Uh, and I, I try to, you know, be sympathetic that, that it, it, you know, somebody who's not been long out of Scientology will still have that worldview and still use that language uh, for a long time. Is there, there's a question that I've been meaning to ask you and forget in, in the previous conversations too. Something that always confused me in these documentaries that I watched with interviews with ex-Scientologists where they would say, they would explain how difficult it is to start their life over after they leave the cult. And, you know, you can, yeah, it makes perfect sense that that would be very difficult. Your whole life was in this organization. All of your personal connections are there. You've worked probably for that organization. You right. are either don't have any money or are in debt because you have all of these Dianetics books lying around that you need to sell. And then you start from scratch with nothing, you know, to lean on. But all of these interviews seem to be taking place in good houses with, like, I, there is not a commentary from the documentary maker about what their life, how they actually did put their life together. And they seem to be doing okay. They seem to be, you know, living pretty comfortably. And it almost makes me, like, maybe that training did help when they needed to find uh, a job afterwards? Well, there's no question that uh, people who come out of the Sea Org are facing a daunting challenge of readapting the, man, the, the modern world. But mm -hmm. what they do not need uh, training on at that point is, is how to work long hours. I mean, Sea Org members, yeah. they have been trained just to deny themselves and work incredible time, hours. I, that question often comes up, you know, especially with Leah's show. That you know, Leah's show always seems to take these interviews seem to take place in really nice homes. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, what are they complaining about? They obviously came out and they were fine. Well, you have to keep in mind that this is a uh, this is a television show, and um, they're you know I, I remember Tom Devot was saying, "Hey, they interviewed me at my tiny apartment. You know, nobody seemed to notice that I lived in this tiny apartment. I wasn't doing too good. And uh, also, you know, we're just seeing a few people." Most of them have, have done very well. I, I mean, one of the, the great stories is Mark and Claire Headley. They came out, they had nothing. They had not been to school. They, they had no connections. But uh, Mark had uh, worked in audiovisual technology in Scientology. And mm -hmm. Claire had done financial stuff. And they were so, former Sea Org members. So they knew how to work. And uh, they told me the story. It was great. I mean, she just... Claire just walked down to the closest diner and just said, do you have, you know, work? No, but maybe the one next door. I mean, she was just like, whatever. She got a hostess job and then a waitress job. And then she ended up, she was doing the books for the restaurant. And then ultimately she was able to open her own, you know, tax preparing business. I mean, so, so uh, industrious, amazing. Mark, a similar story. He just took anything he could get in the technology field and worked his way up. And now he's got his own business. 
So they just know how to work. They work very hard. They've done very well. But I know other people in Scientology that have come out and they've struggled. And they have not been featured on Leah Remini's show. Um, and some of these people lead really marginal lives. So I would just say that, that part of what's going on there is a selection process for television. And it's not necessarily a reflection of, of how people come up. People come out of Scientology and they struggle. Mm -hmm. They struggle and they continue to struggle. Uh, and But even so, even if somebody leaves Scientology and then becomes success, it doesn't change the fact that they were abused and neglected sure. while they were sure. in Scientology. Sure. So I would say listen to them even if they seem to be doing well now. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not, I'm not dismissing their struggle at all. It's just always been confusing to me. Well, and then also keep in mind that, that – uh, uh, I remember last year in season two, there was uh, a couple of young women from out of the country. And so they rented a really nice home to interview them in. And it mm -hmm. had nothing to do with them. So just keep that in mind, too, that, you know, it's it's a choice that Leah's producers are making about how, you know, where they want to film. And mm -hmm. uh, so it's not necessarily reflecting their their what they've been through. Right. Okay, so uh, another thing that starts early in the career and then becomes more pronounced and more sinister as you go deeper is, uh, I, I forget like which, which part of this, of the bridge thing, it, it, it starts first, but very early on, you're told that there are people who are, first they're called antisocial personalities. And you need to identify them by a certain list of characteristics, find them in your lives, and first just write an essay about these people and then as you continue that becomes a suppressive person which is sort of like the enemy of the state was in the soviet union and here you have the enemy of the church that you can't talk to that is evil incarnate right that well, also yeah. i, I, I want to just I'm, I'm trying to make these connections between scientology and the outside world that also yeah. i see sometimes in like somebody goes into therapy and they find out that there are toxic relationships and codependent relationships, which may, I mean, there are people, communication with which, or relationship with which could be harmful to you. But sometimes you see, like, I know this girl who learned about toxic relationships and that she needs to get rid of these, you know, bad influences in her life and cut those people off and then one by one she cut everybody off because every relationship is toxic because if there's difficulty in a relationship that person must be what do you call antisocial personality in Scientology. So how does that evolve? Well in Scientology it often begins with a cold. Uh, is you know it's Hubbard taking everything Hubbard, to an extreme? Huh? <laughs> I know. I mean, Hubbard Hubbard tried to convince them that every illness was psychosomatic. So when you literally get just a cold, you will be asked who is making you sick. They assume that there's some enemy of the church that you are connected to. And I've talked to so many scientists, scientologists that said that they got a cold and they had to sit down and write out a knowledge report about who was making them ill, that there must be somebody in their life that's a potential trouble source or an SP, a suppressive person. Uh, and they really believe that, that there's this enemy of the church out there and your association with them is causing you literally to be ill. And so um, it's it's what it's really all about is, is this constant security force and uh, constant vigilance about, you know, you need to remove everyone from your life who's not, once again, keeping Scientology working. That's always the policy that gets cited. So who is it in your life? Maybe somebody, maybe maybe a relative has decided not to go to Scientology anymore. And maybe they, they're watching Going Clear and maybe they've told you about it. Um, you need to turn that person in. They need to be declared a suppressive person, an enemy of the church. Or if, if it's not, you know, or maybe they're connected to somebody who's an SP and you're relative is uh, what's called a potential trouble source. That's that's somebody who's not an SP themselves, but is connected to an SP. So somebody somebody in your life has made you PTS, made you a potential trouble source, mm -hmm. and it's reflected in the fact that you've got a runny nose. I mean, it's just so ridiculous. But really what it is, it's just it's just part of the, the control mechanism. Uh, and I've pointed out so many times, Scientology is a snitching culture. It's an interrogation culture. You are constantly looking for ways to turn in 
your relatives, your spouse, your children, because if you don't turn them in, they're going to turn you in and you need to get them interrogated. And, you know, these interrogations cost thousands of dollars. So, uh, right, you know, the, yeah. the, one of the best things we have on the website, and we're going to have a new version of it soon um, at the Underground Bunker, so keep an eye out for it, uh, truly remarkable recording. And none of the TV documentaries have taken advantage of it. I don't know why. But uh, there's a woman in Colorado by the name of Sylvia DeWall, and she, at the time she was living in Florida. And she went through these interrogate interrogations and admitted to some crimes, crimes like watching Leah Remini on Dancing with the Stars and watching Lawrence Wright be interviewed on television. These were, these were high crimes in the, in the minds of Scientologists. And so we have this audio recording of her actually being declared a suppressive person by this young ethics officer who's just... His, his staring TRs are down perfect. She even says something about it. Your TRs are great, buddy. Because she, <laughs> she's bringing up to him. I mean, it's, it's audio, so you can't see it. But you can hear her describing the fact that, okay, now that you're declaring me a suppressive person, because I dared to watch Leah Remini on TV, now right. she's going to get kicked out of the church. Her husband, who's a very active member, will be pressured to divorce her. And then the children will have to choose sides. And then their business caters to Scientologists. They're going to lose the business. All of these dominoes fall simply because you watch something on television you're not supposed to watch. That's the level of control and snitching and interrogation there is in the Church of Scientology. And everyone is super paranoid about it all the time. You have to be because it costs you so much money. Not, not only – even if she had not been kicked out, she'd have to pay thousands of dollars for the interrogation. And then, you know, it, it's and then, and, then, and then to convince Scientology that you're you're back on track. The only way you can convince them of that is to spend another 20 grand on some more courses. Then they're mm -hmm. convinced. Oh, OK, great. So you're, you're, you're back on lines. So, uh, you know, it's it's really um, Orwellian, uh, East German Stasi. I mean, however you want to describe it as far as the lives these poor people lead where they're constantly looking over their shoulder at their own family members. Right. And I, I remember talking to a guy, he was in his 70s, and he had made a very good living for quite a few years delivering the low-level courses out of his own home. That was, that was kind of the original model, was you could have franchises, and people would run Dianetics uh, uh, facilities out of their own house, and you could make a, a really good amount of money and then send the person on up the bridge down to the local org. Well, Miscavige has systematically dismantled that over the last 20 years, and it's much rarer. But this guy was running Dianetics classes out of his house, and his own daughter turned him in because he dared to ask her if she had happened to watch the Nightline episode with Jenna Miscavige Hill in it. And... You know, just because he asked her about it, she wrote up a knowledge report, turned him in. He was interrogated. He admitted to watching the episode. They canceled his certifications so that he could no longer make a living. His wife kicked him out of the house. So he was 75 years old. He'd been divorced. He'd lost his house. He'd lost his kids. And he lost any way of making a living. This is what happens in Scientology because of this incredibly heavy indoctrination and, and, and snitching culture. There's a quote I was trying to find ahead of somewhere and then I couldn't find it, but maybe you'll remember what I'm talking about um, uh, through just a reference. That seemed also relevant. There is, uh, it's a quote from Hubbard when he talks about uh, something and I didn't see, maybe I was just looking through uh, too quickly, uh, an elaboration on, on that particular term, but he was talking about the bank agreement which, as far as I could understand, he's talking about like the reality out there, the social realities of our world, the governments and the institutions and whatnot, as a false reality that uh, I guess tries to enslave you into their ways of thinking and Scientology is like the way out. Does that ring a bell? Does that make sense? I don't. I know that he used bank in another way, uh, not just the sort of financial oh, bank. Oh, yeah. But... I actually just found it. Let me. Let me. So this is this is connected to this uh, KSW thing, which it also maybe it's worth just listing these. I have the ten sort of commandments here. Right. 
having the correct technology, knowing the technology, knowing it is correct, teaching correctly the correct technology, applying the technology, seeing that the technology is correctly applied, hammering out of existence incorrect technology, knocking out incorrect applications, closing the door or incorrect technology, and closing the door or on incorrect application. So this is it's just like driving home the kind of fundamentalism of the approach. You should do it by the T, right? That's right. And, and they so, will say, they will say uh, if there's a disagreement, they will say, show me the issue, meaning show me the thing Hubbard wrote that we need to go by because right. everything has to be done to the letter as to how we, uh, just today, uh, 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 Jeffrey Augustine has a piece on the bunker for us about the history of the, the free winds. And this was a ship they bought in the 80s. And only after they bought it, they discovered it had a ter terrible asbestos pro uh, problem. Uh, and uh, there, uh, Jeffrey was quoting this affidavit from somebody who worked on the ship and said the problem they had when they're trying to figure out how to make this ship less dangerous was they could not find anywhere where L. Ron Hubbard had ever used the word asbestos. <laughs> so they, they were a big problem because they knew it was deadly, but if Hubbard never talked about it, then there's no reality for them about how to deal with it. <laughs> so, okay. I mean, this, this is how fundamentalist they are, that they just, it's hard for them to deal with anything if Hubbard has not already explained to them what to do. Yeah, and he's, he goes, again, to lengths to kind of hammer it in that you have to be tough. This is a tough world, and you, you don't whine. You, you know, do the steps, do, do, do this KSW thing. So here's this uh, thing about the bank that I wanted to just have your thoughts on that. What's it, what's it a part of? So it's a, it's from the same series. Uh, uh, it's a conversation you had with Claire on keep Scientology working, and she says um, this is another frequently repeated section of KSW in Scientology. And then there is a quote from uh, Hubbard. I assume goes the bank agreement has made Earth a hell, and if you were looking for hell and found Earth, you would certainly serve. War, famine, agony, and disease has been the lot of man. Right now, the great governments of Earth have developed the means of frying every man, woman, and child on the planet. That is bank. That is the result of, all in caps, collective thought agreement. Right. What he means by bank, remember the other thing to keep in mind about Scientology emerged at the time when the idea of computers were taking hold, uh, mm -hmm. early computers. And so magazines at that time in 1950, 51, were filled with these um, stories about, wow, computers are going to be able to do this and that because computers where technology was very primitive at that time. Hubbard seized on that, not knowing what the hell he was talking about, and put a lot of early ideas about computers in Dianetics. In fact, you know, I've had some people look at it and they say basically he had a Reader's Digest understanding of computers. He didn't know really know what he was talking about. But one of the things that intrigued him was the idea of a data bank, that, that memory bank, and that... I see. That's what he's talking about there is that not just that you have a memory bank and I have a memory bank, but that there's this memory bank of agreement that we all agree to. And, and if you look at um, uh, especially his lectures, he talks about this a lot in his lectures, that even physical laws are things we have agreed upon. They don't have a reality mm -hmm. outside of our agreement. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the example he uses uh, is this planet he called Arslicus, where there's this gigantic city and all these millions of workers, and one day one of the workers decides that gravity doesn't exist or something. I can't remember exactly how it goes. But the point is the entire city collapses because everyone stops believing in gravity. Mm -hmm. And he, he's, what he's telling his audience is, and this is what's holding you back in life is that we've all agreed to these laws of nature that we think can't be changed, but actually they're just agreed upon. And it's all, like you said, it's all in there. War, famine, man's mistreatment of man, 
I mean, it's all part of this data bank, memory bank that we all buy into. And he holds out the idea that you can just erase it all through his processes. It has to be through Hubbard, has to be by the letter, but Scientology holds out this basically superhuman process of becoming so powerful that you can deny the, the laws of physics themselves because they're just matters of agreement. They don't really exist. So he's got, he's got one lecture where he actually talks about that once you get to the OT levels and you unleash those powers, you will be able to crush a planet between your thumb and forefinger. Mm -hmm. This is what he is holding out to his listeners. And if you listen to the lecture, it's great because he's saying it away in a way where everyone in the room was like, well, of course, of course we're going to be able to do that. No big deal. And of course they, yeah, that's, so they spend $2 million getting to OTA and they can't, you know, they don't have any superpowers whatsoever, but they believe that this is what Hubbard is leading them to. And it's, I, I think it's, I think it's actually very characteristic of the entire new age movement that kind of grew out of that moment, that post world war two moment where, you know, the atom bomb had really, you know, I mean, it's just a terrifying idea. The idea that we're literally using the fires of creation to destroy mankind with a bomb, you know, <laughs> it really threw people for a loop. And, you know, John Campbell and, and Hubbard and these others all really believed that the only way mankind was going to survive that horrible idea of atomic annihilation was to literally evolve the human mind to the point where it had mastery over physical laws. Well, I'm sorry, 60 years later, we're still basically primates that, you know, uh, can't jump any higher or run any faster than people before us. But, you know, the, the, uh, they really believe this idea that the laws of physics are simply there because we agree that they're there and we could use mind power to overcome them. That's what that's what he sells. That's what that's what these people spend decades of their lives chasing is to is to disagree with that bank agreement and produce a new world. I mean, you know, in some parts of it, it it's it's you know, they they put some pretty language on how it's a world without war. But really, it's about personal power. These people want these people want to have power over other people. They want to be superhuman. They think they are. I mean, this is the real secret. They already think they're superhuman. They already think that they have lived as Jesus Christ in a previous life. They don't like the fact that nobody recognizes how powerful and amazing they are. And Scientology is going to help them get there. So I, in that way, Scientology is incredibly narcissistic. And it's uh, it just feeds people's sort of fantasies about who they are in a way that, that ultimately becomes very destructive. Yeah. That's some heavy stuff. I mean, I, some of it appeals to me, like this, this kind of like matrix scenario. We live in a collective illusion, and <coughs> yeah, there is a Neo. You can become Neo and, and exactly. control. As a story, that's good. As a, as a idea well, and, to and, and, and this is also why it's so hard. This is also why they're so good at at defending. At, at you know, sometimes uh, you know the the press gets so nasty and. And they're held up to such ridicule. You wonder what, how can they maintain their, you know, uh, involvement. But think about the Matrix. They they definitely think it's like that. That that we live on a prison planet, right. but that all of us can't see it. Right? We're really hooked up to the electrical machine, like Neo was. But we're imagining this, you know, uh, world that we're in. The reality is terrible, and only the Scientologists know it. So. You know, it's like the movie. If you walked up to Neo and said, look, you know, everything's fine. Why are you worried about anything? He would look at you like you're crazy. And then you would say, no, you're, you're in a cult. You're, you're an idiot. You know, what would Neo do? You know, that's they put themselves in that place that the person ridiculing you for being a Scientologist cannot understand that they are a prisoner on a grim prison planet and you are the only one with the truth. That's an incredibly powerful idea. Think about how many movies are based on that idea, right? That the protagonist is the only one who knows what's really going on, and people are trying to convince him that it's 
he's not really seeing aliens or you're not really seeing the mob or you're not really being targeted. And the movie relies on the fact that the protagonist sticks by his guns, doesn't listen to the criticism and wins out in the end. Every Scientologist thinks that way. That when somebody yells at them and says, you know, this whole Xenu thing is ridiculous. Why would you belong to that group? They just think, you know what? Because we have the answers and you don't know what you're talking about. And Paul Hag has talked about that in Going Clear, that the criticism actually reinforces your beliefs and being part of this persecuted group. Because you know only Scientology is true. Only L. Ron Hubbard figured out how the world really worked. Uh, and, you know, it's just you, you try to show these people, L. Ron Hubbard was a crackpot. You know, he, he was just a mediocre science fiction writer. Why? How could this guy really be the one to figure out all the universe's secrets? It's just, it's amazing. Yeah. The reason that that quote jumped at me is, like reading it, I almost felt like I'm reading, uh, I don't know, the internet, you know, people talking about politics today. There's like a lot of conspiratorial thinking today. And the same, like on all sides of the sort of political discourse, it could be that you're not seeing, uh, your own privilege or how patriarchy uh, you know uh, enslaves you or on the other side you're not seeing the deep state and uh, the forces of globalism that Trump or whoever is trying to or all the way to you know lizard people controlling the world and, and, and all that but it seems that kind of thing not to the extent of physical laws is a matter of agreement but this idea that the uh, world outside the narrative that everybody subscribes to is false and your group has it correctly that's pretty prevalent today oh it's, and the accusation is just i see it every day i see conservative people saying that the democratic party and liberals are in a cult i see people right. on the left saying that trump followers are in a cult and you know i just i find it's frustrating because i first of all i think the word cult is so undefined that mm -hmm. is pretty much useless. And um, look, we're human beings. I think a certain way, and it blows my mind that somebody I know that I like as a friend of mine has a completely different point of view on it. It's always shocking when you go when you experience that. It doesn't mean that your friend's in a cult. It just means that for whatever reasons, for their upbringing, for the what they've studied in their lives, what they've been exposed to, they see things in a different way. Now. You know, it's true. There are toxic ideas out there on all parts of the political spectrum, and it's important to keep that in mind. But, you know, this this right now, I think what's really I don't want to get too much into politics, man. But what's very frustrating is and the Internet exacerbates this is that we're, we're just not having a conversation. We're just, you know, in, in the United States in particular, two sides that are talking at each other. And nobody's and there's just no conversation. There's no agreement on facts at all and it's it's really depressing um uh, i've seen long time friendships ending i've seen you know it, it's uh, it's a very toxic environment in our country right now and, it, and I, I i i've been actually kind of receding from it to a certain extent i've actually I, I i have work that i do i have things that i'm interested in and it's just too exhausting to look at people ripping themselves to shreds yeah. every day online on television and uh it's it's been a very difficult year i think for everybody yeah okay i guess i'm gonna suggest that we stop here i have a whole other segment here that i would like to get into uh, the eight dynamics and the tones of uh i don't know exactly how to describe that uh, there's interesting things in how Scientology deals with communication, more acronyms, more rules. Um, well, look, you... I, I, I don't pretend to be an expert on the technology. You've asked me stories, uh, questions about technology. What I'm very fortunate uh, at the website that I got to do that series with experts like Claire Headley, mm -hmm. like Bruce Hines, and Jefferson Hawkins. And they're the real experts. And um, Sonny Pereira has been helping me out a lot lately with stories that involve the technology. We've, we've been taking a, a close look at some of Hubbard's lectures in the last year that I think have not been talked about very much. And those people are the real experts. And, um, 
you know, I would just say watch the website. We've got more stuff coming up along those lines or, you know, drop me a message. I'll be happy to, if anybody's interested in particular technology we look at, uh, I'd be happy to point to things that um, we've dealt with because it's complex. And I mean, you know, some people would say, what, you know, is it worth it? I mean, why, why are we trying to dissect uh, particulars of um, uh, processes if we don't really think that they're based on anything scientific at all? And uh, I think partly it's just curiosity. I mean, these people dedicate decades of their lives to it. It's, it is interesting, I think, to find out exactly how these processes work. Yeah. But, but yeah, it's, just, it's maybe more important to look at the bigger picture about how people are being abused and extorted and silenced. And uh, just the other day, if I got another minute, just the other day, I ran into a couple of people that I was trying to convince to take a, we have some new videos we've been putting up. And I, I asked them to, they want, you know, to take a look at them. And they were just like, well, who cares about Scientology? South Park, South Park showed that they're ridiculous, you know, 15 years mm -hmm. ago, 13 years mm -hmm. ago. And I, and I just like, yeah, well, that, yeah, South Park was 13 years ago, but in those 13 years, they still have tax and status. They're still harming people. So, uh, you know, not everybody's that interested. Not everybody cares about what the inner workings of Scientology. But I think if enough people do that, um, uh, it, it's still why it's such a popular subject online. But uh, I wish more people cared because they're still getting away with things. Uh, for the large part, because uh, just not enough people care about the fact that they're harming people, taking people's money, ripping families apart. So keep an eye on the website. We keep up on it on a daily basis, TonyOrtega.org, and uh, there should be something there that interests you at least every once in a while. I'm going to just add one more time. I've, I've said that numerous times in this conversation, but I, it seems important to me that I think one of the values of looking into this story even in you know this great detail that you do is that it's like a, an extreme case of something that you do notice in other parts of life and organizations movements ideologies groupthink uh all of that and so i think it is it helps you notice these patterns outside of such a weird case as scientology and maybe you know you would be more cautious when you when you there's somebody that is eager to help you explain what the world is and what and how to solve every problem in your life and who's the suppressive person in your life and what exact practices you need to pay for <laughs> to, to get better at life i'm glad uh, you brought that up i think you're exactly right on that and that is a, a great way to look at why this is an important subject it does connect to a lot of other groups and a lot of other movements and how they think they all tend to use the same techniques yeah. and it, it is good to learn from this one so so can i just quickly point out i still got unbreakable miss lovely on sale and on november 1st paulette cooper and i have battlefield scientology coming out uh which is kind of a best of the underground bunker with some of our most important stories going back several years and Paulette's got introductions to each of the sections, so I think people enjoy it. Nice. Looking forward to that. I think there's also the Unbreakable Miss Lovely audio version on Audible. That's right. That's an Audible version of that, yeah. And did you narrate it to yourself? I, I narrated that myself, yeah. That's the way to do it. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy when I see people taking that approach. And I think, I hope I don't mess up the link. If I do, I, I guess I'll change it in editing. But I think if you go to audible.com slash M-O-L-T-V, which stands for Meaning of Life, the site that we are on now, you can download one book for free. Uh, so if people are interested in the story, they can go there and get The Unbreakable Miss Lovely. Great. All right. Thanks, man. That was – I, I really enjoyed these conversations. Right on, man. Okay. Talk to you later, hopefully. Bye.